And now let's see what can be seen in the sky at night with Patrick Moore. I'm in the foothills of the Andes, on the edge of the Atacama Desert, about 300 miles north of Santiago, the capital of Chile. And I'm on the road to one of the great Chilean observatories, Cerro Tololo. This is a breathtaking view over the Andes. And you can also see the winding road, which, um, like the roads to many major observatories, is steep and can be dangerous. Astronomers like this site, and there are two main reasons for that. First, we are nearly 8,000 feet up, so the air is thin and calm. Secondly, we're well south of the equator, and therefore we have the advantage of the far southern stars, which are truly magnificent, but which, from Europe, we can never see. There are several major telescopes here. The largest is the four-meter reflector, which, at the moment, is actually the largest telescope in the southern hemisphere. The heart of any telescope is its mirror. And here we have the 4-metre, or 158-inch mirror, of the main telescope on Cerro Tololo. It really is enormous. It's two foot thick, and it weighs 15 tons. It has a very short focal ratio. It's only f2.8. And that's one reason why this telescope is so amazingly versatile. Needless to say, a mirror like this, one of the finest in the world, was by no means easy to make. Construction took between two and three years. The mounting is of the conventional equatorial type. And the telescope, all 375 tons of it, floats round on a very thin film of oil at a pressure of well over 100 pounds per square inch. And yet, the whole thing is so delicately balanced, you could push it round by hand. Actually, you could do so with one finger. This is also one of the most versatile of all large telescopes. When it's being used for direct photography, and that's the program going on now, the observer sits at the prime focus in a cage at the top of the tube. There's also what's called a Ritchie-Cratian focus behind the main mirror, same general principle as a Cassegrain. And there used to be a Coudet focus, but nowadays that's not used, and the starlight is directed into the spectrograph by means of what are known as fiber optics. At the moment, the telescope is being used by Nicholas Sunset. Well, right now what we're working on is taking plates of a region in the Large Magellanic Cloud uh, to study the, proper, the absolute proper motion of the, of the cloud. This telescope was inaugurated some, I don't recall, 12, 14 years ago. And one of the first objects that was studied was the lar large and the small cloud. And in, in the intervening time, the stars have moved slightly. And we're now at the, the position of being able to measure the absolute proper motion of the cloud. That is the, the transverse velocity on the sky of the cloud. It's 170,000 light years away, so the proper motion must be very small. It's, it's incredibly small. The, the measurement, our first measurement has been six milli arc seconds per century, an incredibly small number. But the reason why we can measure such a small number is that we're measuring literally hundreds of thousands of stars relative to an absolute reference frame of galaxies and quasars behind. Have you definitely got no traces of proper motion at the moment? We think so. The, unfortunately, our second epoch plates, that is the, 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 the plates that were taken later, were not taken on the same telescope. We would like to match the plates that were taken originally with, with plates today. And we believe that we've measured it. It's, it's a three sigma result. It's, it's a curious result. The, um, it's, the cloud appears to be moving in, in exactly the opposite direction that's expected. The, the system of the large and the small clouds are perhaps a binary galaxy system. It's not quite sure. But what is certain is that, there's, that both the small cloud and the large cloud are enveloped by an H1 gas cloud. And that H1 gas cloud tails off behind the, 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 the large cloud off into what's called the Magellanic Stream. And at the head of the small cloud appears to be the, the head of where the, both galaxies are moving into. And so as you would expect on the sky, you would expect to see both the large cloud and the small cloud moving in the direction away from the tail of the hydrogen gas. It's a very obvious direction. What we found is actually the large cloud is moving towards the tail of the, the, the hydrogen gas, which is, uh, which is rather startling. How do you explain that? I don't explain it. Uh, that's why we're taking these plates, just to make absolutely certain. If it is true, um, it's going to make the, the understanding of the large cloud and the small cloud rather complicated. How long do you think it will be before you've got absolutely conclusive results? That's hard for me to say. All I am doing right now is taking the plates. The actual 
hard work is done by a collaborator of mine at the University of California in Santa Cruz, who's an astrometrist, Arnold Klemmler. And I imagine that it's going to, to take a couple of years for him to measure all of these plates, because he has to measure hundreds of thousands of stars and compare them with the old plates. What about the dwarf galaxy in Carina? Yes, the, right now we have the prime focus camera on the telescope, which takes photographic plates. The prime focus camera is not used very much anymore. It's mainly just used for proper motions. And so it's a chance to take plates of other objects that are, that are very intriguing but are complicated because of foreground star contamination. And one of them is the Carina Dwarf Galaxy, which is a rather low galactic latitude field dwarf galaxy. Dwarf galaxies in the past five years have been very, very interesting objects to study because they contain a type of star which is easy to measure radial velocities. And from measuring the radial velocities of these individual stars, there is rather conclusive evidence that most of the mass of the galaxy is not in luminous material, is not in stars. There is another constituent of matter which astronomers and physicists now call dark matter because it cannot be seen. In the case of the, the Ursa Minor and the Draco Dwarf Galaxy, it's possible that up to 90% of the matter of the galaxy is in an unseen form. It is not luminous. And, um, of course, quite apart from what I call the strictly scientific work, there have been some magnificent pictures taken with these telescopes. Oh, yes. It's, uh, the, the, the telescope, would be because, because of the, the very stable skies of Chile, the, one can take photographic plates with incredible resolution, better than arc second images. And this telescope has taken many beautiful photos of, of photographic plates of of objects like 30 Doradas, many globular clusters, the galactic center, the galactic center, which, which culminates almost to the zenith in Chile, is very, very spectacular with, with telescopes such as this. And of course, you do have the advantage of the, uh, the southern skies. Oh, yes. It's, uh, this, this is where all the exciting astronomy is done. The, uh, all of the interesting objects are really in the south, not in the north. Here, on the catwalk of the four meter, we have a magnificent view of most of the telescopes at Cerro Tololo. And I've been joined by instrument specialist Gabriel Martí. I wonder whether you'd tell us which telescope is which. Uh, well, this uh, telescope here is the 1.5 meter telescope. It's a multiple purpose uh, telescope. Uh, the uh, telescope behind is the uh, 91 uh, centimeters telescope. It's uh, specially set up for a uh, direct CCD image. And uh, next one there is the 41 centimeter telescope. That's the uh, main. Uh, project uh, for uh, observing the supernova. And that's, that one is uh, the radio telescope. It has a one meter ditch inside for a millimetric uh, wavelength. And the next one is the Yale telescope. The aperture is uh, one meter and uh, it has a an spectrograph and a 2D, 3D is a special detector. And then uh, the first telescope here is the uh, Schmidt telescope. It's a photographic uh, instrument. And all these are on use on every clear night, presumably. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there's one other, the Lowell telescope. Yeah, well, the Lowell is a little far to, down to the hill. And uh, so, uh, right now it is uh, implemented with uh, photoelectric photometry, too. But uh, there are plans to build uh, an 8-meter telescope and the uh, mountain uh, close to uh, Tololo. Will the 8 meter be a single mirror telescope? Uh, no, it's going to be a, a multiple mirror telescope. They are going to be built uh, with uh, four mirrors uh, of, uh, with an aperture of four meters each one, in order to build an uh, 8 meter telescope. Down there, there's something very strange. It looks and sounds remarkably like a bleeping bucket. <laughs> yeah, that's an echo sounder, and uh, they, that's uh, send a, a sound to the atmosphere in order to measure the thickness of the atmosphere. Cerro Tololo is one of the Southern Hemisphere's major observatories. A few miles away from La Silla, the European Southern Observatory which you visited some time ago, is the third of the observatories in Chile. Not exactly an overpopulated region, and generally speaking, it's inhabited only by a few locals, donkeys, foxes, and astronomers. Well, um, I'm with the astronomers, and those domes you can see mark one of Chile's great observatories, Las Campanas. There are four main telescopes here. Much the largest is the 100-inch, or 2.5-meter, Irene DuPont telescope, exactly the same aperture as the famous 100-inch refractor of Mount Wilson, which was, for so many years, the largest in the world. There's also a 61-centimeter reflector, operated by the University of Toronto. There's a 1-meter, named in honor of the American astronomer Henrietta Swope, who advanced it. 
and also a 25 centimeter reflector. The resident scientist at Las Campinas is Dr. William Kunkel. Uh, here we have the DuPont telescope with a mirror of two meters and a half diameter and a very large secondary. As you can see, the telescope is a, a device with large optical elements because it is intended to work on over a very wide field, a little over one degree, so that the moon would fit three times across the diagonal. Uh, that makes it the world's largest photographic telescope in the sense of taking plates that are 20 inches or 50 centimeters on a side. Perhaps the most interesting work that is going on right now is a rather major survey that attempts to discover the nature and the extent of the distribution of galaxies on a large scale, which would be uh, this thing that we know little about. We call it the great attractor, uh, but uh, are still very much uh, in the dark as to what natural phenomenon uh, produces this effect. What exactly is the great attractor? Well, I think my, the colleagues of ours that are working on this uh, are themselves really very reluctant to say very much, and we, we know it is some kind of agglomeration of galaxies, much more massive than the Virgo cluster, which up to now has been the most important thing that we've studied. And I'm hoping that they will tell us something within two years, but at this point, it's somewhat too early to say. In fact, it's some force affecting the expansion of our particular part of the universe. Uh, quite so. Uh, the thing is that the Hubble constant which tells us at what rate the universe is expanding. At one time, we thought it to be constant. It's become a bit rubbery, so that there are portions of space in which it is less, and other portions of space in which it is larger. And we ourselves, the, the galaxy that we live in, is really in motion with respect to some sort of an arbitrary uh, reference frame, say the Big Bang. And uh, so, the great attractor really is a direct consequence of trying to explain this lack of constancy in the Hubble constant. How exactly is the research here carried out? Well, people, uh, here we have a tremendous advantage in that people can get rather more telescope time for specific limited projects. And uh, people come here much like they go to a hospital in the sense that they, they come for two weeks, they do their thing, we help them out, and then they go away and uh, the discoveries are made at home at a desk. If somebody shouts Eureka, he does it with a pencil and not here at the telescope. But it was at this telescope that a great discovery was made. Using the 25 centimeter telescope in a runoff shed, the supernova in the large Magellanic cloud was found in February 1987. And there's quite a story behind this discovery. It's uh, one of the most unusual collaborations in international astronomy uh, that's sort of off the record. Uh, the thing begins uh, with uh, Dr. Alan Sandage and Gustav Taman, uh, who jointly had a project to discover supernovas in clusters of galaxies. This was a rather massive effort that involved a large crew of people and thousands of photographic plates and uh, they were planned to cover a very large portion of the southern sky to find supernovae in clusters. The idea was that in two years they might discover 25 or so supernovae. Now, the huge abundance of plates that was purchased uh, didn't all come out just exactly right. Uh, one group of plates had a very curious and devastating defect. And that is for each square inch of plate surface, there were about a thousand very tiny black dots looking just exactly the way a supernova might be expected to look. So we had these boxes of plates sitting about. Part one of the story. Part two, Ian Shelton was at that time the resident astronomer for the University of Toronto in charge of their 24-inch telescope. But Ian Shelton is very devoted to astronomy. <coughs> he wanted to do some of his own science. And Halley's Comet 
was, of course, the interesting opportunity. This telescope here was free and available for doing a study of the comet uh, as almost no other telescope can do it. And so he asked permission to use the telescope, and he needed photographic plates. And since a comet is not a pointed object, uh, plates that could be used uh, could have certain defects. We talked about what plates might be suitable. And he agreed to use uh, these plates that had the defects mentioned. In his enthusiasm to photograph Halley's Comet, he wanted to get it as close to the sun under the most difficult conditions. And so among the important Halley plates that he took were those when it just before it disappeared behind the sun and came out on the other side. And so he had to go after something that was circumpolar and very low in the sky. And what better candidate than the Magellanic Clouds? And so he looked at the Magellanic Clouds when no sane astronomer would do so. And that is not when the clouds are high up there, but when they are down low on the horizon. And so two nights before the supernova event, one night before, and on that night, he took a sequence of three plates. And that led to the discovery. And what of the future here? Las Campanus, too, is planning a new generation of telescopes. We have an eight-meter telescope that people have been thinking about for some years now. And uh, the plan is for a single mirror that will be spun on a turntable like a phonograph to give it its parabolic shape. It is uh, planned to be the deepest mirror to be built uh, with a focal ratio of 1.2. So the telescope will look rather like a box. Uh, the telescope is mounted in a very curious way in that it has no bearings at all. Uh, the motion and altitude will float on a couple of rings. The whole thing sits on a round table uh, where it can rotate. And then it will be installed in a dome that isn't very much larger than, than the one that we are on. The sites where it will go, you can see in the foreground, you can see a vertical tower. That is one of the site testing towers. About a kilometer in the background, just in the clouds, you can see another tower. The two sites each have their attractions. The one in, in the distance uh, is on the slope of a mountain where the prevailing winds come up the slope so that it is believed to produce very good seeing. The tower that we have much closer to us happens to be much more easy to get to and is close to the dome that we are on so that the engineering support would be easier. When do you think it will be ready? Well, the, the, we would like to have it ready by 1995. Uh, my guess is that any time between then and 1998. Los Campos is actually the smallest of the three great observatories in Chile. But I think you'll agree that the quality and the extent of the research carried out here is the equal of any. The equipment is first class. The conditions are superb. And the observers who come here from all over the world make the best possible use of the telescopes. And quite apart from all that, Las Campanas is a friendly observatory, even though it is so isolated in the wildest part of the Atacama Desert. Well, that view of the sky at night can be seen again on Saturday afternoon at 4.20 on BBC Two.